Thank you very, very much, Chris, for that introduction. And thank you all for giving up your lunch hours to hear about mud. So, it's much appreciated. Um, that's the title. These are our, the sponsors for the Citizen Project. So you see, we're not doing it on our own at all. Uh, it's a pleasure to see people from both the National Council and the Panel State here today. Is anyone here from Historic England? Ah, never mind. Uh, and uh, we also have a very sponsor. We're particularly grateful to the Heritage Lottery Fund, without which none of this would be happening. Uh, our coastal heritage is disappearing fast. Um, if you go down to the coast and um, sit on the wall, like these people are doing, I wouldn't do that behind you because it's all disappearing fast. So the first thing to remember when going down the coast is keep away from the cliff edge. Don't do any selfies. And if you're doing a foreshore survey underneath it, uh, wear a hard hat. Um, and also um, remember the number of the lifeguard, which is 999. So uh, it's, it's all, the whole coast is disappearing, and we can't stress that enough. Not, not just the archaeology, which is on the foreshore, but the very coast itself. England is smaller than when it used to in the good old days. Uh, we know that there's so much stuff on the coast because. Uh, historic England, or English Heritage, as they were then, mounted an amazing innovative project of wandering, literally wandering around the entire coast, surveying the archaeology on the foreshore. The first time this had been done in any major way, right the way around the coast. And uh, this was called the Rapid Coastal Zone Assessment Survey. Rapid, because they just went there and did it and moved on. Coastal, because it's on the coast. An assessment, because they were just looking at what was available to see at the time. So uh, they've been doing this since about 2000, since the late 1990s, 2000. And it's a snapshot of what was there then. There's no guarantee it'll still be there today. So we need to go back around that entire coast to see what has disappeared and the various storms we've had since the rapid coastal zone assessments were done. But there are a massive body of work which give us a datum line, a fixed point, at which we can continue the study thereafter. And we are finding new things that weren't there when the initial survey was done, and we're finding quite a lot of the things that we've seen in the rapid coastal zone assessment have now gone. So the sea giveth and the sea taketh away. The, uh, the sea is both the agent of discovery and the agent of destruction. So um, this is the sort of mission statement. Uh, we now know that there is an awful lot of archaeological features, our maritime history, our island history, is sitting on the foreshore, uh, but it's threatened by erosion, a uh, very substantial. Uh, and we know also that those archaeological features have no statutory protection. Uh, very few of them are shape of ancient monuments, and uh, they're not protected. They don't have any developer funding because there's no developer you can charge with it. You could try and write a strong letter to the North Sea and tell him to stop destroying stuff, but he never takes any notice. Um, and it seems to us that it's criminal, that's the right word, that our island heritage is being destroyed without trace. Because there is no statutory protection, there's no statutory agency which is prepared to take on that responsibility. So it devolves upon the general public, us, you, me, and the cat, to, uh, to mount the largest community citizen science project in the country to try and record it, uh, a modest aim you might think. Uh, we've tried to set it up through three um, Heritage Lottery Fund projects, the first one of which uh, was the Thames Discovery Programme, where we had a region-based version of the project down here on the Thames, of which uh, Natalie Payne and various other. Can you who share from the Thames Discovery Programme? Let's hear it. <laughs> yes, sir. I can't hear you. Oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> Um, and, and that proved remarkably successful thanks to the engagement with the wonderful 
volunteers that Natalie and her team have um, trained up. Now that showed it is possible, people, and it's been going for 10 years now, people can feel committed to the monitoring program. We don't dig stuff up, we go down year after year after year and see what's left after the last winter storm for the tidal scan. So that proved uh, a useful learning uh, ground, as it were, a training school for a, a regionally based, community based response. So then in 2015, and again with a heritage lottery fund, we set up the first version of a national response uh, where we tried to look at the whole country and try to galvanise the entire nation into uh, caring for their um, coastal heritage. And not entirely successful, but successful in the fact that we were able to develop uh, the means, the tools needed for the job. So taking those two schemes together, the Tenant Discovery Program and Citizen One, we've now put in another application to the wonderful Heritage Lottery Fund for a <coughs> national cross-sector sustainable community-based response. I'll explain what that means later. But um, it's what we're trying to do is embed the communities who do our recording into various institutions to give it sustainability. Uh, so we have two main strands. We have our public data, so we need to tell people about these problems, so we need to raise the profile, and we need participation to get the job done. So um, the current project, which has been running for three or four years, uh, we have a very small team, actually. Uh, we're led by uh, Stephanie up here, who keeps us under control. I can say what I like about her because she's not here. She bullies us terribly. She beats <laughs> us if we don't do what we're told. But uh, she, she runs the project magnificently. And uh, we, we, we run a little office in York with the Council of British Archaeology, <coughs> where we have Megan, or we did have Megan and Andy working up there. We have another office with the Nautical Archaeology Society down in Portsmouth, with Theresa and uh, Alex Lauren. I'm not sure who this guy is. But uh, I wonder if the Heritage Lottery Fund are paying this book. You must check that. And um, in London, uh, hosted by Museum of London Archaeology, we have um, Laura and Oliver. So that's the team to try and do a whole national project. So it's, um, it's slightly tricky, it's slightly overworked, but they're a wonderful team who do their very best. So uh, what we do is we try and raise awareness in this last period, season one, we tried to raise awareness of the at-risk heritage on the coast. We've been training people as much as we can, not just to survey the sites, but also to go back year on year on year to monitor how those sites are doing, what we've lost and what we've found, what's new and what isn't. And this has meant visiting hundreds of sites all the way up and down the country. But you can see that some sites we've only visited <coughs> once, some we've managed to visit twice, um, and very few have been managed to visit it in all three years. It just isn't the time to do it. So um, we've certainly raised the profile, and we've certainly trained a lot of people, but we don't feel that Citizen One was the necessary um, long-term sustainable response. Nevertheless, uh, we, we must celebrate what we were able to do. We've engaged with communities, we've had lots of new workshops, this is, for example, is the, um, this is my IT not working. Oh, yes, it is. Uh, this is the amazing game in Goodburn, who's training our volunteers in the wonders of timber group recording. And are you able to identify this from a late Bronze Age and an uh, early Bronze Age axe mark? Now, he's been hugely useful. This is our team on uh, Mercy Island. And this is Oliver testing out our smartphone app which uh, we use to record things quickly. We don't have a lot of time on the foreshore, so uh, if we can use digital recording techniques uh, that can be done quickly, that's what we want to do. Very briefly, um, over the last three years, we've um, we put on 224 public events and spoken to 8,782 people, allegedly. I think we... 8,783 actually, but uh, we might need to update that. 
And in terms of that, raising the profile, in terms of training people, we were actually trained 1,278 individuals over three years, like way over the around the country, and which through 110 actual training events, training people to record things over a two or five day course, two, two three or four day course. So that's what we've managed to do. And these are the themes that we work with. Um, we look at, obviously, maritime archaeology, ships, boats and barges, the nautical side of things. Um, we look at coastal industries, coastal defences, things which are unique to the coast, which you won't find on any of these boring old terrestrial sites. And we look at lost landscapes, which we'll come back to, and lost settlements. And by looking at all those, those are sort of the archaeological features that we focus on, but we also look at an underlying concepts of different uh, changes to the coast, major changes, major coastal changes, major changes in sea level over time, uh, which all relate to climate change over a long period of time. So we're looking at those three blue things while we're looking at those four orange things. Or are they brown? Or are they five? Or you know, whatever it is, the ones on the top. Um, just to give you some idea, here, for example, um, uh, a wonderful team working down off the Seven Sisters in Sussex, looking at a, a shipwreck, a 1976 shipwreck. You can just see little bits of it running all the way around there. Every time you go back, a little bit more has been lost, uh, but they are, we can therefore record a little bit more that we can see. And if you look around the English coast, there are sorts of different types of vernacular vessels. We're not looking at the same sorts of ships. We have everything from Second World War landing craft, um, ten sailing barges, uh, Mersey flats, seven trails, trails, uh, fishing boats, even lifeboats, heavyweights, all sorts of different types of boats are found on the foreshore, rotting away, abandoned, and um, so we're trying to build up a corpus of those items. And while so doing, uh, we, we've realised that um, some of these vessels are quite hard to get at. Here, for example, is the Hans Edgar schooner in the Thames estuary, which every time we go down, there's yet more planks to see. And as the whole planking goes, it enables us to see more about the structure of the vessel. So the actual destruction of the vessel, we lost the whole bow, um, gives us an opportunity to look at other parts of the structure. But the, the side next to the Thames, the side over that side there, it's very hard to get at, it's slightly dangerous. So we've been developing um, the use of uh, unmanned aerial vehicles or drones, which we can use to fly over the bits we can't get at and film it for us. Uh, and we've, we're using drones more and more because we, uh, the little, the short length of time we have on the beach and the muddiness of some, and the inaccessibility of some of our areas, um, a drone survey is a very quick and fast way of doing things. Um, we also look at various coastal industries, um, things which are unique to the coast. You often get uh, quarries on the coast, even mines. And we look at sea salt production, and I don't mention this in front of Natalie, but we also do fishing and um, all sorts of things. Uh, and all of these are very interesting. They're related to the coast, and they often relate directly to ancient sea levels. But again, we've also had to devise new ways of recording these things. Here on Grantie Island, we have a brick kiln right on the foreshore, hit by the um, Paul Harbour currents every day. And the only way we can possibly record anything as detailed as that over time, year on year, is to use um, photographic 3D modelling. So uh, this is, uh, I can't switch it on, but this is a 3D model of that um, the year before. The year before it became that. So, by doing these 3D models, it's so again, it's just done digitally, uh, we can record things year on year and then look at those models year on year and see, and see as they decay and disappear. So, it's preservation by record or indeed by uh, 3D photogrammetry rather than preservation by sticking it in a museum. Um, Here's one from Ashley. Sorry, she's, a, she's mad about fish traps. <laughs> I had to put this in in case she came. 
This is a mid-Saxon fish trap in Essex. You can see these line of stakes, uh, which would have wattle hurdle work between them, and wattle hurdle work there, and then the basket at the end. So the idea is the, the tide comes in with all the fish, the fish gets stuck in the basket, and when the tide goes out, the fish are left there, and you can just collect the fish without all this going out to sea and trawling and stuff. Yeah. Being involved in fights with Spanish fishermen and things. So it's a, it's an extraordinary. If you can afford these large fish to build these large fish traps, you get fish every day. They say you have to like fish. So provided you like fish, this is harvesting the sea in a very sustainable way. Now the other thing about these, apart from telling us that in the mid-Saxon period they just loved fish, it also tells us what the sea level was like then and also where the currents were going at that time, because these are orientated on the inward and outward current, because they have to be to take the fish. And the idea is that at very low tide, you can walk out and collect the fish that are stranded in there, which you can't do today. So there is built into this structure the actual levels of the tank, of the uh, blackwater, as it was in the mid-Saxon period. So we have an absolute date and then an absolute level for this. We can reconstruct the former tidal amplitude of uh, the River Blackwater or any other river we choose to work on. So, uh, very interesting, and look at how sea levels have changed since then. The same thing is true of sea salt making, another industry which um, is very important in the past. Uh, before the age of fridges and freezers, the only way you could preserve things was either by air drying, by um, smoke drying or by salting. So this is hugely important if you want to have fish or meat to last for longer than a day. And so what you have on the case <coughs> is um, these ponds to collect seawater and then you have to heat it up to drive off the water and you're left with the salt. And that's a very important commodity. So important that whole estuarine industries are based on it. Here, for example, at Tolsbury in Essex again, um, here you can see the red earth, which is this fire reddened earth, which is the detritus of sea salt manufacture. It's a very clear indication. It's called a red hill because it's a hill of red. Essex is often flat, so a little mound of um, uh, clay, bird clay river, it's called a hill. It's like the Alps, only smaller. And um, here you see a seawall which stops there and then starts again there. And there was a breach for the seawall here in the post medieval period, so this is managed realignment in effect. And that's exposed on the foreshore a series of these red hills, which some are found inland underneath salt marsh, but these are actually exposed on the open coast. And uh, sea salt manufacture again is based on the contemporary high tide levels. They relate directly to whatever was the foreshore of the day. So you get your Iron Age and Roman salt working sites up here. Then further down the foreshore at the lower level you get your Bronze Age structures, because uh, that was the height of high tide in the Bronze Age. And down here you get your Neolithic site, because that was high tide in the Neolithic. So by collecting the levels and the dates of various things on the foreshore, you can see how the foreshore has changed and sea levels have changed between the Neolithic, the Bronze Age, and the Roman period. So we're looking not just at sea salt manufacture, but also about changing sea levels uh, in the antiquity and the rate at which it changes. We do the same with our uh, coastal defences and other of our themes. Um, we're always fighting somebody in this country, and some of us trying to fight. <coughs> uh, so we keep building defences. Uh, here you see some of the Second World War defences put up 80 years ago. Uh, in fear of a, 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 a Nazi invasion. And in that time, just 80 years, the coast has changed so much that this concrete pillbox has collapsed onto the beach. So once again, it's a measure of how much the coast has changed in a mere 80 years. We are all, all the odd, our country is under threat again, not by hostile armies, but from a ferocious sea, as my friend Winston Churchill said. In addition to that, we can also look at lost settlements. 
our coast is being pounded by these seas, but um, here in Shepherd's famous volume, you have um, no less than 36 medieval settlements, medieval settlements on the Yorkshire coast, all of which have been inundated by the sea, and uh, quite a few of them now set further inland. So that's a huge settlement for us. Yorkshire prides itself on being the largest county in England, far more, but it's getting smaller. Has anyone here from Yorkshire? <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. I just warned you, it's getting smaller. <laughs> Sorry, I'll, I'll do more work. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, sorry, yes. Uh, well, moving round, the, so that's that was in the past, so uh, there's lots of stories there. But um, coastal erosion of settlements is continuing. This is, this is really quite frightening. 1998, living memory, 10 years later, this is Haysborough in Norfolk. See that little red line there? Um, you see those houses there? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine, nine. See that lifeboat wrap there? Look, they're all gone. This is the sea defence put up, um, which surviving in 1998. Notice the defence is completely gone, and that so had all those houses. In just 10 years, the east coast of England still disappearing. This is not what happened in the good old days. This is what is happening now. And if we're losing all these houses and settlements, what chance does the archaeology on the foreshore stand? It's disappearing along with you. So this moves us into what we call the Lost Landscapes Project, which is looking at the prehistory of our coast. In the really good old days, we were actually part of Europe. Uh, this is the, the green bit represents land as it was uh, in prehistory uh, when the River Thames used to exit at Haysborough. And um, before the peninsula was breached, all this was land. And at very low tides, some of this land still emerges as what we call submerged forest. Um, ancient prehistoric landscapes, the root systems of trees, which once grew on the land, which is now no more. And uh, some of these do go back to the Mesolithic period, and they're now being re-exposed to the regular tidal scour and are beginning to disappear again. So these are quite amazing ancient landscapes. Now, way up north, there was um, a wonderful volunteer character, uh, not a professional archaeologist, called Gordon Roberts, who used to take his, both his wife and his dog walking on the foreshore up at Hornby. Uh, and as, he, as they walked up and down, he kept noticing all these footprints in the uh, very solid silts up there, which subsequently dried out, and he felt convinced they were prehistoric. No one would believe him, of course, because he wasn't a real archaeologist. But uh, then he kept finding um, auric footprints. Now, that's a prehistoric creature, because they, they've been extinct in this country for several years now. Um, so, he, he finally persuaded me that they were actually prehistoric human footprints, and now everyone believes him, of course. You know what they make called Roberts, they finally believe him. And, and they can date by the overlying deposits to anything from 5000 BC to 100 BC. They are prehistoric footprints, survival of a um, family, of a, a, a man or a woman with a child taking a walk along the foreshore looking for you know, seashells or whatever it is. But quite extraordinary, actual footprints, actual humans in the prehistoric landscape. Again, not protected, they will all go unless they're recorded. Now to go back to Haysborough, I, I don't know much about um, pronunciation in Norfolk, but we apparently call this Haysborough there's an awful lot of unnecessary letters in there. Anyone from Norfolk? Okay, sorry, that's a wonderful name, Haysborough. Um, and um, what you can see here is something that we don't do, but the British Museum did, and that's they dug a hole in the foreshore and found this amazing occupation uh, 8,000 years before present with flint tools and bits of old mammoth flying over and stuff. 
that in the public's health. Now, I would love to have done the risk assessment for this site. Here you've got a Cranberry Cliff, one of the most unstable cliffs in England. Here you've got a very deep hole, with no shattering. And here you've got a very robust and they were digging that. Well, we don't do anything like that. Uh, we are sensible. We only wander around the beach. But this shows you how deep, how low the um, prehistoric ground surface was. This is pre ice age. How deep the land surface used to be 8,000 years deep. It's below the present day foreshore, which is below the present day high tide. So to go deep, and you'll find all sorts of ancient things. And for those interested, this is when we were still part of France, and France was still part of us. Now, um, moving up a few millennia, uh, here's some more prehistory that turned up in Essex. And this is a wonderful story because it does show the community involvement. Um, <coughs> here on Mersey, they still collect oysters manually today. Um, Dan and Fraction's son go out every day and collect oysters. They pack them up, walk back, it's a very wide beach, and sell them in London. So if you're buying any oysters in London, the chances are that Dan and Fraction's son have actually collected them. And they're the last of the line. So they know the foreshore very well. They know where to walk and where not to walk, and where the oysters will be and where the oysters won't be. And the other day, they came across these old planks on the foreshore. And they thought, I haven't seen them before. Sorry, they, they ha I haven't seen these before. <laughs> so they alerted um, the wonderful James and Mark, who are two of our volunteers down there, who had been trained. And they alerted Sibson. And so we sent a little team down there. And working with them, we had a go at cleaning these things up. Whoops, wrong one, this one. And um, what they turned out to be is, is planks from a Bronze Age track rock. Now, you can be forgiven for not noticing them on the first slide. They were just bits of wood covered in silk. But when they cleaned up, you can see they are uh, river planks on a, a, a brushwood platform or a, a, a brushwood raft. And they've been, now been radiocarbon dated to at 952 BC, so a Bronze Age date, for a Bronze Age trackway, which at the time must have been about the high water mark. Now it's below the sea. Now, the good guys in uh, Mark, the, the good guys in Essex loved these timbers so much, they did what we don't normally do, and they collected them. They decided, let's keep these and stick them in the museum. We don't normally do that, but these guys raised the money to do it, and they put them in the Mersey Museum. <coughs> So uh, the planks were having been recorded. Again, we use digital recording. There's our targets. You put the targets down, and you just wander around photographing it, and you have a digital record. It's much quicker than trying to draw them, and it gives you a 3D model of the timbers. So it all had to be done in a day in one tide. So once you've done that, the timbers were lifted. We borrowed Mark's ladder, and then we borrowed Mark's boat. Uh, stuck him in the boat and then he wandered around the estuary and uh, uh, got them into the museum. So it was very much a community project uh, to find, record, lift and display in the Mersey Museum uh, these uh, ancient bits of Bronze Age wood. They're very proud of their trackway, which you can say they should be. So that told us a bit about Bronze Age sea levels and how different they are. And here's another crazy story um, from the Bronze Age. Uh, this is the White Cliffs of um, Seven Sisters. And this is a half section well or shaft visible in the cliff edge. It's extraordinary. These are, these are humans. Well, they're archaeologists, but they're also humans. <laughs> because they have such a large scale. And cool. um, that, that is amazing, isn't it? Now, that's about, actually I think it's about 1977, around about 1980 when that image was, was taken. And uh, if you look at it, you've still got the uh, footholds or handholds that cut in all the way up the shaft. You can just see them on there. Now, that's interesting. But what I think is even more interesting is this. 
this was actually drawn. This is the, the top of the cliff, and this is the English Channel. It was actually drawn in 1912 when it was part of, of um, uh, an excavation which was for an earthwork site looking at some Bronze Age earthworks there. So the edge of the cliff was well to the south of the well in 1912. By 1980, all this had eroded and the line of the cliff cut through the cliff about there. So we lost all that since 1912. Today, we now know we've lost all that since you saw that photograph in the 1980s. It's another 30 metres have gone and the nuclear edge is right back there. And we know that because our wonderful team at Berlin Gap actually found the bottom of the shaft on the beach. And this is the cliff edge, 30 metres away, and there's the bottom of the shaft. And this must be true because that's Professor Martin Bell, who is the king or god of Institute of Zone Archaeology, inspecting it. So, you know, he won't lie to me. <laughs> really? <laughs> so, um, we're using these prehistoric features as a sort of proxy for coastal erosion. So we can tell you how <coughs> any of you think the white cliffs of Dover are going to be there as a bastion against the pressure from across the channel, they ain't. <laughs> They're disappearing as fast as the Essex coast. So that's coastal change. We also look at sea level change over time. I'll do this very quickly because we're running out of time. Uh, on various inland sites, and this is a, a program we're taking up to the foreshore, um, if we find, for example, a, a, a Roman site with a, a Roman warehouse, and we put an exact, and we get a date for that, and we put an exact level on the floor of the Roman warehouse, we find the working surface of the Roman quayside, and we find the top of the Roman timber wharf, and the bottom of it, and we find a tidally flush drain running through it, we can construct the tidal amplitude, the tidal range in the Roman period, in the late first century. So we use our dendro dates to give us the dates of the structures, and we level everything to give us the tidal range for the Roman period. And uh, we can see what that tidal range actually was, and we can relate that tidal range to the present day tidal range. And we can do the same for medieval structures or Anglo-Saxon structures. So we're gathering data using archaeological sites to reconstruct sea levels as they were in the past. We've done this on terrestrial sites quite a lot. And um, if we plot all this out, this is our medieval levels from about um, 700, 800. High tide would be out there. About uh, 1,200 would be about there. And about 1,400 high tides can be about there. So that looks all jolly fine. So if you draw a nice line there, you can predict the future. Or so you think. But um, what you actually find is that there's a sudden change. The sea level rise isn't gradual. It suddenly shoots up at this point. Uh, this is modern day high tide and low tide, and that's the 40th century one. It's rising even faster now. I think this is what we call the Anthropocene. This is uh, the great burning of fossil fuels and such like after the Industrial Revolution has um, caused climate change, if that's the right word, to speed up a bit. And this, these levels were taken by using the London and therefore must be true. I'm sure you won't doubt that. But it's an extremely alarming prospect. But what we're trying to demonstrate is that if we look back into the past, at sea levels in the past, that will not only inform our understanding of the past, but it also informs about the future. We can predict the future. We can tell you what the coast will be like, what sea levels will be like in the future. So we're not stuck in an ivory tower looking backwards. We're also trying to help you uh, uh, devise your flood resilient strategies for the future. Um, just to give you a very quick example, here we are down in Kent looking at one of these submerged forests. Here you see these great 100 year old trees thrown down on the beach, um, which is what normally these submerged forests look like, these 
massive great oaks lying <coughs> around on the beach. But this looks slightly different, um, the victim of rising sea levels. Um, in this particular instance, although we did find some very large trees, we also found lots of much smaller bits of wood, uh, little poles, and um, uh, not exactly twigs, but uh, much younger trees lying around. Which is quite unusual in a submerged forest, which we later showed to be Bronze Age. So what does that tell you? It's not a Cranach or a um, house platform, which we first saw. But if you think about a coppice woodland, are you all familiar with coppice woodlands? Yes. Here you can see uh, a standard coppice woodland uh, which has large trees like this. Big, big, these are the standards. And in between them, you have uh, a coppice stool, which is a much uh, uh, a multi stemmed root system which you cut the tops of every five years or ten years, whatever it is. So there you see the, the coppice crop being cropped. That's what it looks like before it's cut down. That's what it looks like after it's cut down. So a classic managed woodland is what we call coppice. There you see the uncut ones with standards. There's the standards. So what would happen if there was a sudden inundation and you lost these big standards and you lost your crop of coppice woodwork? What would it look like? Covered in silt. Well, here you have the standards. There's this huge standard there. And here you see the remains of uh, some coppice poles. Covered in silt, inundated in a sudden storm. Nobody would leave that much wood lying around in antiquity because that's a valuable resource. That must have been uh, A, cut and coppiced, and B, inundated, and C, inaccessible. No one would leave you know, 93 bags of coal in that area. So um, here we have a very good example of <coughs> sudden inundation due to rising sea levels. And uh, we had a look at the tree rings, or rather Rob Bale at the University of Lancaster had a look at the tree rings, and uh, we are guessing that the inundation event was around about 1,840 calendar BC. But what was also interesting is that the ring sequence, I don't know if you can see, this is a clean part of the tree. These are very wide rings. Can you see how wide those are? Whereas these are very narrow rings. Can you see how narrow they are? Not the best slide. But here's a tabulation of those wide, these are the, the ring sequences, at least the width of the rings from um, you know, year one to year 121. And you can see here, here we have the life of a happy tree. The complacent rings, uh, the ring width changes every year, but basically speaking, it's a very happy tree uh, with relatively wide rings. Now over here, after about ring 60, we get a very unhappy tree. The rings get narrower and narrower, and they're all falling below the line, and some of these rings are very narrow indeed. And they represent um, uh, so, you know, suppressed spring growth represents um, uh, a climate which is deteriorating and, and uh, unhappy for trees and therefore presumably unhappy for humans. So here you see very clearly that this um, sea level rise is, is affecting not just the trees but also seemingly the humans for a generation or so before the final inundation in 121-121 ring uh, sequence. At that point, the trees all fall down and we get inundation. So you can actually see the process, the life cycle of the trees and therefore the humans as sea level is rising and the salt water is affecting the growth of the trees. So um, we're looking at all these things. So this is what we want to take forward to the new program, which I'll whisk through very quickly. We're going to establish, we hope, this is our next application. Um, <coughs> We have three strands. First of all, we're going to establish six new flagship community-based discovery programs, just like the Thames Discovery Program and the Blue North. And um, you've got one on the Humber, one in Liverpool Bay, uh, the Blackpool Hill, East Kent, uh, South Devon, and uh, in, in Solent. And we're embedding them all in, in the local universities. We're getting them to help us run our training programs 
and um, our research project. We're focusing on these six sites so that we can uh, get a good, solid, community, committed community working on these programs and a good, solid university taking the evidence forward and researching it in depth. Um, so we actually have six hubs. So if we're looking at sea level change, we've got six different hubs looking at it in different parts of the country uh, for, to compare and contrast. So this is good for the community and good for the research embedded in universities which will last longer than the HLF grant. We're also moving forward to um, what we call responsible stewardship where we are looking at um, the various conservation agencies like the National Trust, the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds, the National Parks, institutions which are responsible not just for their sites but also for the care of their sites. And we're trying to persuade them, or we will hopefully persuade them, to using community engagement and training their staff, um, indulge in some heritage asset monitoring and some coastal erosion monitoring <coughs> programs as part of a voluntary protocol which we hope they'll adopt. Uh, we call responsible stewardship. Citizen will provide the training to the uh, wardens and rangers uh, for those organisations and then they will train their volunteers using the citizen methodology numbers. We train one ranger, that ranger will train 500 volunteers. This extends the coverage of our monitoring program from our six little sites into all the sites owned by those various institutions. That's the theory. So we only have six sites where we'll be doing all the work. And if you look at the National Trust sites, which are always, which and very useful places that we're not covering, we can uh, extend our spread by training the officers of the National Trust to train their volunteers. Natalie's looking very disbelieving here. Um, and then we do the same at the National Parks, which are also in very useful places where we don't necessarily have a focus. We have six National Parks. All National Parks always have archaeologists on staff, so we just train those archaeologists to train their the volunteers in the next North Hill School and South Wales, New Forest, and next one. So that gives us another national spread. So that's three different lots. And then if we look at the estuaries, a lot of those have um, Royal Society for the Protection of Bird People reserves. And they have a mere 18,000 volunteers. So all we need is, you know, sort of 0.5% of those working on all those estuaries and then get those monitoring as well. So embed our methodology into those normally sustainable organisations and um, get them to monitor the archaeology while they're um, looking at warblers or whatever they look at. You know what I mean. The final little um, aspect, the third little key to doing the entire case, uh, how could you remember the Kitla Scout mass trespass of 1932? A marvellous, brilliant, marvellous occasion in which the right to reign is established rather than the right to kill and grouse. And um, that King Scout mass trespass led to the National Park legislation. The land is ours, not just um, for a few people. And uh, slowly but slowly, uh, we established the National Parks and things like the long distance footpath. And believe it or not, the walkers' right to roam was only finally legalised in uh, 2000. A lot of people don't know that. Uh, and the Countryside and Rights of Way Act, uh, 2000. The point about all this is another major footpath is just being designed. Or just being implemented, I should say, by a natural England. And it's the England Coast Path, which is a mere 2,795 miles long. Extraordinary achievement when it's completed in 2020, uh, based on the Union Coastal Act 2009. Now, we are, of course, delighted about this, and uh, we are going to work with Natural England and the National Trust, uh, particularly Natural England, to uh, flag up various archaeological sites on the foreshore, as opposed to on the coast, and get them into their maps, apps, and websites, etc. Interesting things to visit on your walk around the coast. So, um, we're, we're going to collaborate with Natural England. We're going to identify suitable sites, provide the information on those sites, and provide an app 
to guide the English Coast Park walkers to their site. And while they're there, <coughs> the, the act that got them to the site, we're going to ask them to take a little photograph of the site while they're there. Uh, therefore, we'll be able to monitor those sites year on year on year, every time a rambler goes past one of the sites we just directed them to. In this way, we will have coverage of 4,500 kilometres as the longest archaeological site in England. Oh, boy. So, in order to do this, we need to raise the profile to get everything interesting, <coughs> and we're doing this through these crazy TV series, which is starting, which is re-showing a brilliant no time, wonderful program, on, um, which is showing from September 8th at 7 p.m. looking at sites of classic source of fire, so the next six weeks. It's a bit media orientated, but it does show at least some of what Sydney is trying to do uh, down there on the foreshore. So the last showing, the first showing of um, the series, we can get over a million people watching. So I think that is raising the public profile, which is, uh, we're not doing it for the money, believe you me. Um, so, the point about all this is we're, we're putting in an application to the Heritage Lottery Fund to mount this huge, sustainable three-year project. In three years, we think we'll make this sustainable for the next 40 years. I am heading it in universities, national trust, etc., etc. So, will they buy it? Heritage Lottery Fund. Well, um, I, I should can't say, Chris Arthur, I'm actually from the HLF. But, uh, Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. That's all right, no, that's fine. I don't want you to embarrass yourself by saying something. Oh, no, I wasn't. It's quite, quite the contrary. I'll <laughs> 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 just try to entertain you. <laughs> Heritage Lottery Fund, we deal with heritage in a big way. We're doing the largest heritage site in England. So heritage is certainly core to what we do. And there's a lot of, lot of it. So, um, you know, 4,000 kilometres of it. So that's one thing we do. But we also um, like to think it's not just about heritage, it's also about people. And uh, we like to think that our uh, project that we're trying to promote is a... Um, uh, <laughs> that's a project which I'm promoting. Oh yes, it's a, a social, this is a quote here, a, social, a socially inclusive project which promotes physical and mental well-being in a natural environment. Now, if you want to translate that into English, it means we have fun. <laughs> <laughs> and here you see what we're trying to do, engaging the public to record their heritage while enjoying themselves. Um, so I think that's all I need to say. So this is this is our website. So do follow us on all these social media things. And um, thanks for giving up your lunch hours. Thank you very much.